Uh, good evening, let's get started please. We have 10 Evans as the overflow. So if there's no space to sit, although there's plenty of seats in the middle, so if you want to just stand up, fill in the middle. Uh, but 10 Evans is the overflow, it's simulcast there. The resolution is much better than in the past. So if you've had issues with simulcast in the past, previous semesters, the system is much better this semester in terms of resolution, your ability to see the screen. However, because that system, some of the webcast lectures are a bit delayed, they're working on that, all right? So anyway, let's run through the lab. My name is Mike Meehan. Um, you have my information on the syllabus. I go by Mike. Just call me Mike. I'll address you by your first name as well. Um, we'll go over office hours. I'll post that on B Space. But let's get started with some of the lab material. So my main focus here will be on cells. You learned how to use the microscope last lab. So you went through the techniques of setting color illumination. Again, you need to set color illumination each time you use the microscope. What that involves is making sure you have the right amount of light from the filled diaphragm, the lower one, and that you position the condenser at the right height, and that you adjust how much light goes through the aperture diaphragm. So those three steps are necessary to set color illumination. Okay? But of course, you have to have the specimen in focus first. So I'll go over a few of these things. We'll talk about animal use. We do do dissections in the second half. There will be uh, four labs in the second half of the course associated with dissections one of which will be the rat dissection lab. Uh, we do the rat lab because the anatomy of the rat is extremely similar to a human anatomy, except for the absence of a gallbladder. Otherwise, it's very similar, okay? So you'll do that rat dissection. We'll also do some invertebrate dissections. Now, we're not gonna force you to do the dissection. So if you have a moral objection, you don't have to do the dissections, but we would prefer that you at least observe because you will be tested on it. Lab exam two will consist of a series of black and white questions and also uh, color images. So no actual dissections on the exam in terms of looking at a dissected animal, but images thereof, okay? So we do work with animals. You'll need to do those dissections so you know the material. And seawater plating, this is rather quick. This exercise, the seawater plating, will continue for several lab exercises. So for the next few labs, you're gonna work with the seawater and the plates thereof but you're also going to be doing other lab exercises that lab. For example, next week you'll do a streak. It takes no more than five minutes. You don't leave after five minutes. Instead, you'll do the enzyme lab. After that, you'll do another streak in the photosynthesis lab. You do the photosynthesis lab. So it's a way that it's a consecutive series of labs. So what I'll do is I'll brief review of equipment, the micropipetters and the microscopes. We'll talk about prokaryotes animal use, care and ethics thereof, and eukaryotes, and then the work with the Vibrio. Now I've switched my office hour on Wednesday because we had several other people doing one to two, and I realized the Friday morning lab is nine to 12. Since we have the 1A lecture eight to nine, there's no opportunity for those students to potentially have questions answered. So I've switched my office hour from one to two on Wednesday to Thursday, 5.30 to 6.30, to give those Friday morning labs an opportunity to come to office hours. Is that clear? And that's the basis for that. So with micropipetters, these deliver microliters. I realized there was a font substitution, which made it a mil. The P1000 is for volumes up to 1,000 microliters, not 1,000 mils. That would be a liter. That would be pretty, a huge volume to hold by that. So we have the P20, the P200, and P1000. Remember, this window corresponds to the volume that will be taken up or dispensed. And remember, there's two points of resistance. When you press down the plunger, that corresponds to the first point of resistance, corresponds to 10 microliters here. You'd put that in your solution and slowly release the plunger. It should then be filled with 10 microliters. You'd put the tip, and you always have to use the tip. You'd put the tip on the side of a tube that you're dispensing into and slowly press down on that plunger. First point of resistance, probably all the liquid is out. But you can still go past that first point of resistance to a second one to expel any residual volume of liquid left in that micropipetter tip. Any questions about the micropipetters? You'll be working with them. Uh, we'll do some experiments with PCR, and you'll need to micropipette maybe two microliters or five. So you have to be pretty precise with them. In terms of the microscope, if you remember, this is the design of them. This is a compound scope. It consists of the objective lenses here and the ocular lenses here. So total magnification is the variable objective times the fixed 10x oculars. 
And here shows you this field of view. And we see nice sharp lines that correspond to the plate in this diaphragm. We know we've positioned the condenser in the correct spot. Okay? So that's how you know how to set the position of the condenser. I started the lecture by saying with cooler illumination, it's probably easiest to think of three main points. One is the filled diaphragm, the lower one. And what we want to do here is we want to open it until we just fill out the field of view. That means you don't have extra light. It's not necessary. FOV is field of view. That's that circular image when you're looking down the microscope. And remember, we're looking down on the microscope. The stage is here with your slide, cover slip. And there is typically, if you're doing a wet mount, there is a column of liquid here. And as a result, your specimen can, well, I'll just use yellow. The specimen can be positioned anywhere in that column, which is why you always want to use a 4x objective to initially focus the microscope. Why? Because the 4x has a big depth of focus looking down, so you probably have this entire column of liquid in focus. Plus, you have a larger field of view. As a result, if you're looking for a specimen, larger field of view, more in focus, always start with the low power objective initially. So it's in focus, you set the filled diaphragm, you open it, it just fills the field of view, you position the condenser, and a lot of times students say, there's so many steps, I get lost with all of them. So this is kind of a big overview of it, position the condenser, and the way you can tell you position it is sharp lines, on the plates. By sharp lines, what I mean is when you look at the plates here of the field diaphragm, you can see a sharp line, sharp line, sharp line. Now this is a rectangular field of view. That's not what your microscopes are. They're a circle. So once I open this field of view, that field diaphragm down here, I would fill that field of view. Of course, you continue to open it. You expand the light out more and more and more. But that's all wasted light. In fact, it affects your ability to see specimens, which is why you want to have your field of view just, this diaphragm just open to your field of view. We position the condenser, so we have those nice sharp lines. So here's the condenser adjustment knob here. So we know that what we've done is use this condenser, a series of lenses, to focus the light on the ideal spot right where this specimen is on this slide. That's the light beam there. And then the last part is somewhat subjective. That is, we adjust the aperture diaphragm. And if you decrease it, you increase contrast so you can see things, but it will limit your resolution. So it's always a balance. And I'll show you a couple images where the aperture diaphragm is really open here and we almost lose the specimen because it's washed out by the excess light. So this is somewhat subjective, this aperture diaphragm here, okay? And of course, it's unfortunate with our scopes, but when you have this field of view, just open it, make sure it's centered. Okay, so that's kind of the big thing there. You did the calibration so that you know in the future, whenever you use that microscope at a given magnification, and there are only four total magnifications here, because you have four objectives and the oculars. So once you've calibrated at a given magnification, that's true every time you use that microscope. The purpose of this calibration is so that you know these ruler marks represent some distance. So when you're looking at something unknown, you can measure how big it is. Okay? We'll go over how you can use that in a minute. And of course, here's uh, the hollow glass tube and the solid rod here. This is to illustrate how the sections at high power are very thin. So as I increase magnification, my depth of focus decreases. So my optical section is thinner here, than here, than here. In fact, it's so thin that I can optically section the very middle of that hollow tube 
And as a result, I can see one leading edge of the piece of glass, the other leading edge, the space in between, that edge and that edge. Of course, as you, so if this is that tube, can I borrow this? Not yours? If this is that hollow tube, if I'm right here in the center, watch what happens as I change the magnification, uh, the focus. And when you change the focus, the stage moves up and down. So if I could have an assistant, you're going to re represent the depth of focus. Just hold out your hands like that. That's the depth of focus. And then we're going to make it real thin. So if I'm here just starting to get to the top, I would just see one line representing the top. As I go further up, I'd see those lines getting further and further apart, right? If I'm right in the center, I'd see edge, edge, space, edge, edge. Thanks. So with the microscope, you're optically sectioning specimens. That is the most difficult thing to grasp with the microscope, is when we have these sections, how in the world do you recreate the three-dimensional image? Because effectively what you're doing is when you use that optical section, you have a layer of information like this with an image. You have another layer of information with that image. So in your mind, you need to take all these effectively two-dimensional sections, they're not really because there's depth to them, and piece them together to recreate the three-dimensional image. And that's what they do with uh, like a CAT scanner that. They take a thin section, another thin section, and then they use a computer to put it all together. Okay? And of course, how we know which one is on top is if I take and raise the specimen to get it into focus, whatever appears first was the one on top, and if I lowered it to get it in focus, whichever one was on bottom appears first. Any questions about that? We're going to go over the optical sectioning again. I made a demo here. It fell apart on me as I was riding the bike up, so I'm going to re-put the cell together. So here's this microscope. Here's that light source here on off switch. Adjust the rheostat here. Light goes through the field diaphragm, focused by the condenser lenses onto the specimen, which on the stage. Want to stress again, our microscopes, they have this stage holder. The way it works is you just take your thumb or finger and rotate it out to the side. It's got a spring tension that pulls it out to the side. You put your slide there. Please do not bend this up and then put the slide underneath it. It will work, but you'll break it very quickly. I know a lot of the high school microscopes do just that, where they have a clip here and you put the slide underneath it. Instead, these are clinical stage holders, so just push on it with your thumb, you'll know, open the space, put your slide there. Any questions about that? Uh, one morning, unfortunately we did not know about this when we bought these microscopes. When you focus this, of course this is the um, fine focus and coarse focus, do not hold both knobs at the same time when you do this, meaning left and right. Because there's a shaft there and if you hold the right one and the left one and you try to turn the right one and hold the left one stationary, you'll snap the rod in there. So just always use either the right side or left side when you focus. Um, we usually get about two or three of those broken a semester. It happens, uh, but just try to be careful. I'm not going to go through all these things. Now, it's important you understand what they do. That is, you know, what does this knob here do? Six, you know, you take and center that filled diaphragm. All right, so just be familiar with that. Interpupillary distance, you did this, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but basically you want to have one field of view, you're using both eyes. The advantage of that is because, again, we're doing these optical sections, and you want that depth of focus, and you're used to using two eyes. You know, if you close one eye and look at your nose, and then close the other one, it looks as though your nose moves, right? Because your eye reference is different. So you want to use two eyes. If you want to test your ability to get that depth of focus, go play catch with a baseball or football and do it with one eye closed. You're going to struggle a bit. It's doable, but it's a lot easier with both eyes, okay? So try to use both eyes. Clearly, if you don't have vision in one eye or there's issues, uh, do your best, okay? All right, and this again is that centering the field of view. There's how the plates look nice and sharp. There's that distance of 100 micrometers. So in this case, there's 40 equal spaces in this measuring device. So how big is each equal space? 
What's the math? 100 divided by 40 is 2.5. Okay? At 1,000x, I'll just tell you this, this is how it's designed. If you were to go back and look at your chart, you would see there's a direct mathematical relationship. That is, as you increase magnification, the distance represented decreases. So at 1,000x, each ruler space is actually 1 micron or 1 micrometer. So at 100x, each space or ruler mark is actually 10 micrometers. Because in this direction, we're decreasing the magnification, right? In this direction, we're increasing magnification. So this decreases tenfold, this decreases tenfold, so this increases tenfold. Direct mathematical relationship. You may not have realized that, but there is that relationship. Now, unfortunately, there's been some printing problems with the uh, manual at uh, Replica Copy. I will always, we've posted the corrections, but I will always try and lecture to point out the specific issues that we've seen. First off, this chart looks kind of weird in the ones from Replica Copy. It's fine on B space. This is a cladogram. What it illustrates is evolutionary relationships between various groups. In this case, the level of the group is the domain. So we have three domains. We have the eubacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. Okay? These two groups used to be called monarins, that kingdom. They are indeed prokaryotes because they lack a membrane-bound nucleus. They lack the DNA within the nucleus. Okay? Now, we always say, oh, prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles. In fact, they do, but it's not common. So we even refer to prokaryotes, we're referring to the absence of a nucleus, okay? The eukaryotes do have a nucleus, and you know, of course, there's protists and animals and plants and fungi there in terms of the kingdoms. But these two lack prokaryotes. Notice the archaea are more closely related to the eukaryotes than the eubacteria. So there was a common ancestor that gave rise to this split here. Okay? A cladogram shows you relationships. They're supposed to reflect evolutionary history. So the protobiont is that first thing that wasn't really living or first thing that was living. We have the eubacteria. I prefer the term eubacteria because we used to clump these two groups into the bacteria but the reason we did that because we didn't know anything about this group. But once we've discovered this group, it's confusing to call them bacteria. So I will always try to refer to these as eubacteria and these as the archaea. And of course, these are the eukaryotes to avoid any confusion. Is that clear? Any questions about that? No? Okay. Uh, there is a question in the pre-lab, which is not meant to be confusing, but it, people always struggle with it. This is a static image shown in only one representation. This is trichonympha. The pre-lab is trying to get you to realize that when you have that specimen on the slide and it's in this column of liquid, it's free to be in, the, in any orientation and moving. So you may not necessarily see it strictly from that side, so you have to make a prediction what would it look like from a different perspective. So that's what that entire thing is about is what would this look like if you were looking straight down on it from this perspective? Or you could say, what would it look like if you were looking from that or this side? Okay, does that make sense? Because remember, these specimens can be in any orientation in this column of liquid, and they will be potentially moving. All right, so let's quick do the uh, prokaryotes. So we're going to talk about three shapes, uh, the rod shape, the bacillus, round one, the cocci, and the spirals, the spirilli. Some various features here. Bacterial chromosome. Usually there's only one. There are some exceptions, but we're going to say broad generalization. One circular chromosome, double-stranded. It has the entire genome in there. There can be some other small pieces of DNA in there that's called plasma DNA, but for now let's just focus on the genome. They have these structures called pili that help with mating, various things like that. 
They have the nucleotide, which is just basically this region of DNA. This DNA is not naked. Most of the textbooks used to always say, oh, prokaryotes, not again, differentiating between eukaryotes, sorry, between archaeans and eubacteria, they would just say uh, bacteria have naked DNA. That's definitely not the case. They have some packing, they have to, to fit that large length of DNA in that small cell. And they also have regulatory proteins on there. They have ribosomes, which are the organelles, of course, for protein synthesis. They have the cell wall on the outside. We'll talk a bit about gram staining and how that is reflective of the cell wall composition and why we do gram staining. The capsule refers to this stuff outside the cell wall. It's usually a polysaccharide extracellular matrix. It's outside the cell wall, but it's usually polysaccharides. And flagella for moving. Okay? And these flagella are pretty interesting how they work. They actually spin around, rotate to propel them. So let's talk a little bit about the gram stain. Now I'm going to put this on the board. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the OCHEM person doesn't apparently erase the boards. And they use this colored chalk, which makes it really tough to erase. So I'll talk to them in the future. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to start with a gram-positive bacterium. So what I'm going to do is illustrate to you what will happen during the steps. Realize the way gram staining is done. You do the steps, and then look at the color of the bacterium after you've done the staining. But to teach it, I'm going to first do a gram-positive bacterium. They have a very thick cell wall. They have, of course, the plasma membrane. They have the DNA. They have ribosomes, et cetera. So what we'll do here is we'll add it. We, we put it on a slide. We fix it to the slide. So they're on that slide now. They're stuck there. So we fix it to the slide. We add crystal violet, which is a blue color. It's a dye. And these are all for specific lengths of time, et cetera. So we add crystal violet. And the crystal violet enters the cell, binds to the cell wall. We add iodine. That helps to fix it to the cell. We then do a step with ethanol or acetone. And I should not be doing that in red, so you don't think it's the saffron in red. And what the ethanol does is it does take and remove some of the crystal violet. But because it's iodine, they're large complexes. We then add a counter stain. So it's a second stain, so it's sometimes called a counter stain, which is saffron in red, which is a red color. And then we basically do a decolorize, rinse with water, et cetera. And these are specific lengths of time. But in the end, if it's a gram-positive bacterium, because of this thick cell wall, we see violet or purple colored cells. Okay. If it was a gram-negative bacterium, we're going to start off with the cell wall composition. And of course, realize when this staining procedure was developed, they had no idea about the biochemistry of the cell wall. They just came up with a technique to help them identify bacteria. And actually, I think it was lung tissue initially. So we're going to start off with gram negative. They have an outer membrane. And it's a phospholipid bilayer with some other lipids in there. They have the cell wall, but it's thin. And of course, they have the plasma membrane, which is the inner membrane. So they'll oftentimes talk about inner and outer membrane. It's 
So the technique's the same. So let's look what happens in each step. Again, I'm teaching you first what happens, but realize in the end we have the bacteria and we don't know if it's going to be gram positive or gram negative. We do the staining and then can tell if it's violet or red. So we add the crystal violet. We add the iodine. We then have the ethanol. And the ethanol causes this outer membrane to basically dissolve. And as a result, the crystal violet iodine complexes basically are free to diffuse out of that cell. And then we do our counter stain with saffron red in that. And then we observe, and what we'll see is red colored cells. The advantage of this is since this staining procedure is so simple to do, it takes a few minutes, we can tell quickly whether it's gram positive or gram negative bacteria because certain antibiotics are only effective against gram positive and others are only effective against gram negative. And of course, some are effective against all of them, okay, because they might affect the ribosomes. So the ribosomes of the gram positive, gram negative would be the same. So a chemical that affects the ribosomes would be okay, but a chemical that affects this cell wall composition would not necessarily be expected to affect this cell wall composition. So if you've ever had like a culture done or that, that's oftentimes what they're trying to do, okay? Nowadays, of course, with PCR, they can just PCR the culture and quickly figure out what specific bacterium it is. So if we look at the slides here, there's that gram-positive thick cell wall. There's that phospholipid bilayer. Here's the gram-negative. We have this outer membrane here, inner membrane here, thin cell wall. That ethanol step removes this, which allows that crystal violet here to basically diffuse outward crystal violet iodine. So this is what we see. These are gram positive. These are coxoid uh, shape. These are the bacillus shape. These are gram negative and gram negative. Okay. Now, you are not going to be doing gram staining in lab. These will be demo scopes set up for you. So on the side of the rooms will be demo scopes. Just look at them. Please use only the fine focus. Don't manipulate the stage. Don't adjust the coarse focus, etc. Because these cells are small in the range of 1 to 10 micrometers at most, we have tried to precisely position this slide where we have the best image. So you should only have to use the fine focus, the small knob. If for some reason it looks like what it shouldn't and we have images there to help you, ask the GSI and we can try to reset up the microscopes. But again, fine focus only, don't maneuver the stage. Any questions about that? Okay, and this is just uh, kind of interesting. This is a sourdough starter. I don't know if you make sourdough or that, you have a starter. But, you know, there's different compositions of yeast bacteria. That's why sourdough dough from San Francisco tastes different than sourdough from New York, et cetera, because there's different bacteria and yeast in the air. And you can change how long you uh, basically keep this at room temperature or in the refrigerator to affect the growth of yeast or bacteria to change the flavor. So there's kind of an art to bread making if you want good tasting bread. All right, so how small are these cells? Here's a math problem for you. This cell is one micrometer cube. pH is seven. How many protons are within that cell? So if you really want to figure out how many protons are there, how would you do it? I'm just going to do the volume for you because that may not be intuitive. One micrometer is one times 10 minus four centimeters. So this Cubed is this centimeters, knowing this is mils. This then becomes 1 times 10 minus 15th liters. So the volume of this cell is 1 times 10 minus 15th liters. The pH is 7. Um, how many protons are there? So go ahead and try to answer that right now. Anyone have the answer? I, 
I hear one answer from up front. The answer is 60. Let's figure it out. You know the volume is 1 times 10 minus 15th liters. What's the concentration of protons? Remember pH is what? Minus log of the concentration. So what's the concentration? 1 times 10 minus 7th moles per liter. So that tells us we have 1 times 10 to the minus 22 moles. And then how do you calculate the number of molecules? Multiply by Avogadro's number. which is about 60. So there aren't many protons there in that cell at pH 7. That just gives you a sense of how small these cells really are. Okay. Now, be prepared for those types of questions. You know, we're, we have this mandate to try to integrate more math and chemistry into biology, so I'll do my best to try to do that, okay? Um, so... One of the things about these antibiotics, uh, you may know that there's a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria now. It's a real problem with uh, hospital infections. So probably one of the worst places to be is in a hospital because they have a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria there. So you potentially can be exposed to them. Um, and in World War II, they discovered penicillin. And this is kind of exaggeration. Cures gonorrhea in four hours. Doesn't cure it in four hours. But it's pretty darn effective. But now there are potentially resistant strains. So the key thing about this is Widespread use of antibiotics in chicken feed, various feed sources like that, are really helping to spread these antibiotic resistant bacteria. So there's, of course, uh, concerns about that. How many of you have heard about these antibiotic resistant bacteria? Yeah, it's definitely an issue. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do now is switch over completely to the animal care. I hope. Uh, that didn't work. Okay. So as I mentioned, you will work with animals in this course in terms of dissections. Uh, we used to have a chordate diversity lab where you could actually handle uh, live chordates, things like chinchillas, we've had foxes, we've had owls, hawks, crocodile, things like that. But it would probably be too difficult now to do something like that because if you're going to handle live vertebrates, there's additional training, which would take several hours. So instead, we can't do that lab anymore. But what we will talk a bit about is how you need to treat and respect the animals that you will work with. And in particular, the university is mostly concerned with vertebrates or chordates, pretty much just vertebrates. But there are three groups that address this. So we have to, every few years, write a specific protocol that we say how many animals we're using, how we're euthanizing them, various things like that, and get justification on them. They are very concerned about treatment of them. To give an example, when we euthanize the rats, uh, the sound of the air, so the CO2 going in the chamber, may uh, make the rats nervous. So sometimes they want us to design a muffler system so they don't hear the air entering the chamber so they're not too worked up. So these are v important things to address. But there's three groups, the Animal Care and Use Committee, the Office of Animal Care and Use, and Office of Laboratory Animal Care, or OLAC. All right? And basically, we use them in teaching as I mentioned before, the rat's anatomy is extremely similar to yours. Okay? We don't have the luxury of having you do a human cadaver. It would be very difficult with this number of students. If you take an anatomy class, you might have that opportunity. Certainly at other schools where they have uh, more lab space, you can actually usually have four students work on a given cadaver for the entire semester. But bottom line is, we use them for... Uh, teaching purposes, of course, they're used on campus for research. They serve as model organisms for various human diseases, uh, transmission of diseases, treatments, things like that. So this is some of them that have been used. But again, we're going to have you work with the rat lab to see 
physiology. So you'll look at various organ systems, you'll learn about the function of those organs, etc. Okay? And this mostly started uh, in 1966. Uh, there are photos like this. There has been absolutely abysmal treatment of various animals used in research. And these groups have been organized and started to address some of this. Uh, I don't know how to describe it except just uh, unnecessary type of research, okay? Unnecessary treatment of those animals. So anyway, um, it was despicable, the treatment of them. So now we have specific things. In fact, if the temperature fluctuates too much, uh, they have higher priority in terms of these animal research facilities and housing than a, a classroom, by far. Uh, by far. It took me 15 years to get uh, airflow in my office. If I had a rat housed in there, which I kept telling them I was going to do, they would have had to fix it within a day. Um, <laughs> but that would have required me to have a new ACUC proposal, which I knew would never fly. Anyway, various laws and policy that take place. Um, and we have vets on staff. We have a head veterinarian as well. We have animal welfare regulations that have specific uh, treatment in terms of food and water, housing, number of animals per cage, overall weight, feeding schedules, things like that. Um, and if it's a human primate, of course, they're more concerned. Uh, but bottom line is, there is training necessary, and that's what this is involving, is for you to recognize the need for those animals and to treat them properly, okay? So um, general laws, things like that, you don't have to worry about them too much, um, but just treat the animals with respect. What we do when we write these protocols is we have ACUC review our proposal, we try to get alternative teaching models. Right now, there's no good rat videos to show this. There are good rat videos to do summary of dissections in that, to do review, but none that are real good in terms of starting the dissections and things like that. The other thing is, that isn't addressed here, is we'll be dissecting over 300 rats. We will find potentially some disease states, some abnormal physiology, abnormal um, anatomy, and when we find that, we want to point it out to you. I know of absolutely no program that ever introduces a mutation or disease state in one of their dissection videos, okay? So anyway, uh, we write up specific protocols for ACUC. Uh, it gets reviewed. There are three R's, replacement. As I mentioned, we don't have a good system to replace the rat. We've tried. I've looked at various things out there. So far right now, there isn't any, any real good out there, at least not to the point that I think they should substitute the actual dissection, okay? And again, we're not going to force you to do the dissection, but you should observe it so you know the material, okay? If for some reason you and your partner absolutely refuse, split up the partnership and find someone who wants to do it. There are some students who are absolutely gung-ho and want to do everything, okay? Find that partner if you have concerns, okay? Reduction, we actually go through and try to minimize this. We do a rat per pair of students. But you will take and exchange the rats later so that you look at both sexes, male and female, okay? So that you don't have to dissect both a male and female rat, but you do have to know the anatomy of both, okay? And refinement, we go through, as I mentioned, procedures to minimize the pain associated with the euthanization and also enhance the well-being and, of course, respect. So for this, I'm going to ask you not to name the rats when you do the rat dissection. That's not real respectful. Um, if you want to dissect a rat to study for lab exam two, we will not provide you the rat, nor can you do it in our facilities. But if you want to get dissecting equipment, we are willing to check you out dissecting equipment so you can do the dissection elsewhere, OK? But we will not provide any space to do it. <laughs> Some students want to do the dissections over. We'll give you places where you can buy worms and uh, crayfish, 99 Ranch, etc. for these things, okay? Um, anyway, so this just shows you the vets at work here on campus. Um, and if you have issues with how the animals are being treated, please inform me, please inform the GSI, and if you think a fellow student isn't respectful or isn't showing the proper treatment, tell your GSI so we can try to resolve it, okay? All right? Um, and we do have to go through accreditation each, not every year, but fairly often. Um, and then this just, uh, if you're working with live animals, which we don't anymore, uh, because of the additional training, uh, you have to have additional training. So some of you may already work in research labs where you work with uh, 
live animals, and if so, you probably have done this extra uh, training. If you have concerns, as I've mentioned, please contact myself, okay? And also, phone number here or email. Now, I'm going to warn you right now, when I do the rat dissection, I will probably wear a lab coat, and I will keep the rat in my pocket of the lab coat. And the reason for that is because rigor mortis will set in, and it's very difficult for me to do the dissection if the rat's been dead for an hour and a half. So if I keep it in my lab coat, it'll be closer to my body core to keep it warmer, so it's easier to do the dissection. So it's not out of disrespect, it's for that reason, okay? The other option I will try to do is potentially have the staff bring it up with like 15 minutes left. That's my preferred choice, but sometimes they may not remember, and then that's a problem, okay? So anyway, uh, just telling you that's what I'll be doing, not to uh, scare you at the time, okay? Anyway, uh, just remember these things. And in summary, we do use animals. All of you should be aware of the regulations governing the ethical use and teaching, as well as appropriate ways to report concerns, and further training is required if you handle live animals. And then, of course, you have all this information in your reader so that if you have concerns, you can address them, okay? Now, with the rat, it is a valuable resource for you to learn about vertebrate anatomy. To maximize the usefulness of these the rats, we donate them to the native bird connections afterwards. So we're going to have you make sure you remove all the dissecting pins because they will feed various uh, native birds that they have on display in that. And of course, if you've left pins in the rat and they eat those, you'll potentially damage or kill their birds. So what we do is we interject a step. They would still need the rats for their native birds. They still need them. What we've done instead is we've said, we'll provide the rats for you. Now, the rats come from specific labs. They should be pathogen-free. These are not like rats you trap in the sewer or you see running around at campus at night. Um, <laughs> the other night, while riding my bike past uh, RSF, I actually ran over a rat in my bike, <laughs> about one in the morning. Um, and I'd actually seen it for about a week. So maybe it was, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> so I'm sure it was still fine. They're pretty hurt. Uh, strong individuals. But anyway, native bird connections, we donate them. So we're again, we're trying to maximize the usefulness of these rats. Because I know it's concern for people, okay? And like I say, we do go through about 300 of these, so it's a fair number. Um, and I, but right now, that's sort of um, where we're at on this, okay? Okay, now we're going to pop over to the eukaryotic cells. And this is an animal cell. We have the... Nucleus here, where the DNA is contained, is, again, it's not naked. It's packed with specific proteins. In this case, there are multiple linear chromosomes. And we can talk about the nucleolus, which is the site where basically what happens is we used to think, oh, the DNA is put in here any old which way. But it's actually highly organized along this nuclear envelope. It's called an envelope because there are two membranes with a space between them. And Dr. Pauli addressed this in lecture today. So if this is that nuclear envelope, it looks like this, and each one of them is a phospholipid bilayer, and then this would be the next portion of it, and then this is that nuclear core that regulates things in and out, and you saw that movie today where the RNA was going out and then we had translation, okay? So we have the nucleus here, contains the DNA. We have various parts of the endomembrane system, the Golgi, rough ER, smooth ER, and then we have vesicles coming off and targeting. So I won't spend much time on that. We certainly can't get that through the resolution of our microscopes. Um, but there are a few things we should understand. The reason why cells are small, typically, is because if they're really large, we have issues with the surface area, the volume increasing faster than the surface area. So we can't get exchanged. Remember, this cell is directly interplaying with the external environment. Whether it happens to be another cell or the external environment, it has to have a service at which to take things up and export things out. And as a result, you need to have a large amount of surface area for those things to occur in, and that's why we typically don't find huge cells. There are exceptions. Some nerve cells can be a meter long. Okay? 
Um, and there are special mechanisms to address that. Here goes through a list of sort of a cells one micrometer. If you strictly had glucose diffusing from one side to the next, about a millisecond. If it's two, it's now four. If it's 10, about nine. If it's 1,000, you know, you start getting up to the second uh, thing. That's too long. Cells have to be more dynamic. So if cells are really large, there's an issue unless they have cytoplasmic streaming, which is bulk mixing of the cytoplasm. Okay, and we'll see that in lab. Okay. So we have single cell. Again, we have exchange across the surface. We can have multi cell. We'll talk more about cnidarians or hydra specifically in the second half. But again, diffusion across the surface, small cells. In terms of the various things you'll be looking at, you'll be looking at the prokaryotes in terms of the gram staining. You'll also look at some cyanobacteria, which are a type of uh, eubacterium. They are photosynthetic. They do carbon fixation. And you'll be looking at those. And in terms of how do you make drawings? Now, with bacteria, they're so small, they're typically about 1 to 10 micrometers at most. But if you have something like amoeba that's quite large, when you make your drawing, how do you know what kind of scale bar to put on it? So let's just briefly go over what the drawing guidelines are. You always have to have a scale bar so I know how big it is. Your GSI knows how big it is. So one way I kind of address this in lab, when people are struggling with it, I say, draw a map of California. And usually the students are like, oh, I'm not from California. It's OK. And then there's this. And then I say, draw the map of US. Then maybe like that. And then I'm saying to them, now you're telling me that the US is smaller than the west coast of California? And of course it isn't. So what they can do is they can add a scale bar that gives me some information to know that. So in this case, that scale bar might be 150 miles. In this case, the same size scale bar, though it doesn't have to be, might be 600 miles. So the scale bar conveys the information about how big it really is. So make your drawing, use your measuring device to get the actual size, and then add your scale bar. Does that make sense? No, yes? Yes? I'm more than willing to go over it again if I need to. OK? All right. So what we have here is there's always scale bars. This is the amoeba. They're kind of hard to see. This is Nitella. This is one huge, huge cell. This is a centimeter. So a molecule diffused from there to there might take 10 hours or five days. I haven't done the calculation. So to get around that, we just have bulk mixing. It's like when you make hot chocolate. You can pour the mix in your milk or water, and you can just let it sit there and come back in about five weeks, and it will have diffused, and you can drink your hot chocolate. But you don't want to wait that long. So you just bulk mix it with a spoon. Same thing is happening here with cytoplasmic streaming. Bulk mixing to get a molecule from this end of the cell to that very quickly. And you'll see that. It's pretty cool. This is the Elodea. There's a red spot there. It's not an eye. It is a photoreceptor, meaning it can detect light so that these things can locomote to the ideal position for photosynthesis in terms of the light quality and quantity. Because if it's too much, it might bleach the pigments. Okay. Here shows you two images. I've done this because a lot of time when students are working with a the microscope, they oftentimes forget about this step here. That is, adjust the aperture diaphragm. So what you see here is, this is with the aperture diaphragm open all the way, and you can barely see that amoeba. And here is where it's closed down. So closing it down increases the contrast. So if you have it too bright, you won't see things, OK? Now, I will try to help you find specimens. Your GSI and UGSI will try to help you find specimen. If you see me, I will always, always switch to the 4x objective first, because that gives me the biggest field of view and the biggest column of depth of field i.e. a cylinder, to find that specimen. In fact, looking down on this, if this is that slide and this is the cover slip looking down, the best way to do this is use the stage manipulator to go like this and back like this. And you can scan the entire cover slip in probably 15 seconds, as long as you're under low power. And you know the entire column of liquids in focus. If you don't see anything there, you don't have anything. Make a new slide. But if you're at a higher power, your field of view is smaller, your column, your depth of field of view is smaller, and so you might be at this upper level with your small, thin optical section, and you'll never see the specimen. 
Again, that's the reason why you want the low power objective. Biggest depth of field, biggest field of view. I don't think I can stress that enough. I usually help like 100 students find specimens, and they're always amazed when I can find them in like three seconds. And I usually close down the aperture diaphragm, and I switch to the 4x objective. If you lose something, so you had something and you lose it, switch to the lower power objective to make it easier to find it again. All right? You're going to be doing uh, some cheek swabs, basically some toothpicks. They're in the fume hood. They've been autoclaved. There's forceps there. We would like you to use the forceps to grab a toothpick. Don't reach in there with your hand because other people will be grabbing those toothpicks too. Reach the forceps, grab it. You're going to scrape the inside of your cheek gently. You don't need to draw blood. Gently. <laughs> cells will come off. Now the moment those cells are on the toothpick and exposed to the outside air, they're in a new environment. They're interacting with a new environment. So those cells will dry up, desiccate, die very quickly. So what you want to have ready before you do that is you want to have a slide prepared. And what you have on there is a drop of methylene blue in a sodium chloride solution. And what this sodium chloride solution is, it's basically isotonic. So those cells shouldn't shrivel up, nor should they explode. Because they're animal cells, they don't have the cell wall to counteract that force. So you have your saline already ready to go with methylene blue, you add your cheek cells, then you add your cover slip. Okay? The methylene blue is specific for DNA. So what that means is, in order to see things, we need to have a contrast between the organelle, some component of the cell. Since the methylene blue is colored blue, it binds specific to DNA. As a result, the nucleus should stain, and we should see the nucleus, it's a differential stain. Now, you might see some other small things here. Uh, there are mitochondria that do have DNA, um, but they're usually below the limit of resolution of these microscopes, OK? All right. Uh, occasionally, we find some interesting things in the tongue scraping. Um, just happens. In terms of the eukaryotic cells, this is a plant cell here. Remember, they have an external cell wall. So they have a huge, typically a huge central vacuole. Animal cells have vacuoles or small vacuoles. Oftentimes, people won't even call them that. But they're not this large. This large central vacuole controls the, uh, basically the rigidity of the cell, the turgor of the cell. If the central vacuole is filled with uh, fluid, it pushes against the cell wall. You can see that entire leaf looking normal. If you've had water loss, the central vacuole shrivels up, the cells shrivel, and you see basically wilting of those uh, leaf or whatever. Okay? So we have cell wall. There are connections between these to allow communication between cells. So they are in direct communication. In fact, the plasma membrane extends from this cell to the adjacent cell through these structures called plasmodesmata. And uh, Dr. Pauli will talk more about those. Okay? Um, we have mitochondria, of course, the powerhouse. Uh, chloroplasts, which are unique for capturing light and doing photosynthesis. We have an entire lab on photosynthesis, so we'll learn a lot more about these. They have parts of the cytoskeleton, microtubules, intermediate filaments, microfilaments. These cytoskeletal elements are responsible for the cytoplasmic streaming. And of course, the ribosomes are too small to see. And the nucleus you probably will not see unless you added a differential stain because the index of refraction of the fluid in the nucleus is about that of the external environment, so it's effectively invisible to your eye, unless you added a differential stain. Okay? The chloroplasts are easy to see because they have that green pigmentation, the chlorophyll. This shows the elodea here. This is a macroscopic view. That's a dime there, so you can see how big this is. The given uh, leaf here, here shows you this. There's usually a couple cell layers thick. What you're going to do is rip the end of that so that you can get a thin section. Here shows you a close-up of the cell. Now, chloroplasts are easy to see. This was very unusual. You probably won't see this. Here's the nucleus here, and the nucleolus there. That's not typically easy to see. Okay? But notice there are lots of chloroplasts. Okay? Now, it can be very difficult to work with the microscope and understand what you see and what it corresponds to. So I have a cell here. Hopefully it will work. I'm going to put this on the Elmo projector. So Anna, if I could have the Elmo projector.
OK. So you can see the tap. This is a plastic box. Those packing peanuts represent chloroplasts. And what we'll see, I usually make the analogy, the following analogy, and people always have struggle with it. Imagine you bought a basketball that won some national championship, the last basket. Really expensive, really precious. So you spend $20,000 for it. You're probably not going to have them ship it in a garbage bag labeled to you and just send it, right? You're going to want them to put it in a box, put packing peanuts in it, put the basketball in, put more packing peanuts, put packing peanuts in the top, seal that box up, maybe put another box, et cetera, okay? So that's kind of what a plant cell is. We have this large central vacuole in there, right? So there's a large central vacuole. And as a result, we can't see that now because we are focused on the top of the cell. And remember, with a microscope, we can optically section look at the top, the middle, or the bottom, right? So just realize, of course, that this looks different. Ignore the handle, not typically in the cell. But you're going to see that this is a smaller dimension than this. So when you're looking at a plant cell like this, you will actually see the top versus the bottom versus the sides. Okay? So if you're focusing on the top, what you see are all those chloroplasts. If you focus on the bottom, all you see are those chloroplasts or packing peanuts. Now, you've not cut this with a knife. You've done an optical section through this. Okay? So what I'm going to do now is remember, with the microscope, we optically section this. So I'm going to take off the lid. And then effectively, we're going to be at a different layer. So what we're doing is going to the middle. Now, what do you see? You see this large central vacuole. And you see all the chloroplasts around the periphery of that cell, right? And of course, you would see, you know, if you're at the lower part of the cell, in terms of this, you'd see it change in size, because it's kind of round like this. So what you can do with the microscope is you can optically section that cell and see what it looks like. Now, here it's easy to say, OK, this is what it looks like here, and then it looks like this, and then here, because you have the three-dimensional image. Instead, the tough part with the microscope is you're going to do the following. You're going to have the cell not knowing what it looks like for real, and you're going to take those thin optical sections and then try to reassemble those thin optical sections to recreate that three-dimensional image. It's easier this way because you start with the three-dimensional image. So in the pre-lab and worksheet, one of the things we're asking you, what would the cell look like if you were in the middle of the cell? And remember that large central vacuole so are we on the top, middle, or bottom of the cell? Either top or bottom. I don't know which one, right? But we're certainly not in the middle because we'd see all the, now here we can start to see those there. Okay. You're also going to be looking at some diatoms. And the purpose of this is to try to get a little bit of statistics in the lab. So you're going to be looking at ones that have three corners and just binate, pinnate like this, two. And you'll keep track of them. Okay. For the Vibrio. Uh, please write this down. We just did some controls. And controls are always a necessary part of experiments. They allow us to make sure we're going to get good results. So instead of using 100 microliters, we're going to use 200 microliters. That should give you about maybe 20 colonies on your plate. It will vary. But about of those 20, maybe four or five will be bioluminescent. Okay? All right. Now, I'm going to go over grades right now. And I'll tell you, I hate discussing grades, but we're going to do it anyway. I always forget it. Because you need to know how grades are determined. They're based upon total points. That will consist of lab exams one and two and quiz scores. So this is the way it's done. I add up your lab exam one and two and quiz scores, and I get your total points. And for the entire class, I make a distribution like this, a histogram. And I say, OK, there's a cutoff, a cutoff. Now, this is true for Bio 1A as well. We make a histogram like this, and we figure cutoffs. We try to look for parts that are you know, nice, convenient ones. We also keep the same GPA within plus or minus 0 0.5, actually closer to 0 0.02, every semester so we can avoid grade inflation or grade deflation. So that's what we do. So there are always some students who are oh so close. And what do we do with those students who we consider to be borderline? What I will do is when I meet with the GSIs, both for Bio 1A and the lab class at the end of the semester, they will get a grade sheet with their students' names and their grade. And one column will say bump question mark. So the GSI gets to talk to me and say, which of these students will you bump? We will not bump all of them, because if we did that, 
it would be just moving the curve down, and then we'd have another set. So we will bump a subset of the students. And for the 1A class, I had the score on the final, because it's comprehensive. So I can say, gee, how'd the student do on the final? Did they show improvement relative to exam one and two? And if so, let's bump them. Unless the GSI says, oh, they never came, they were a pain, they weren't cooperative, blah, blah, blah. Then I say, that's fine, okay? So that happens occasionally, not often. But the bottom line is, in the lab class, I don't have something like that. Instead, for the lab class, I'll just talk to the GSIs and say, which of these students do you feel are most worthy of the bump? And we limit it to two per section for each section they teach. If they teach two sections, which most of the GSIs do, they can take all four from one section, three from one, one from the other, two and two. However they feel, the students are most deserving. Okay? Now, there is a problem with this approach. Okay? Uh, this is the way most classes do it. I don't know if they do the borderlines, but I think it's important because we want to treat you as individuals for those cases where, I mean, you're so close. Okay? Quiz scores. I guarantee you that some GSIs are going to write harder quizzes and be harder grader than others. I tell them to shoot for an average of about 70% on the quizzes, okay, so that I can do some adjustments. So let me show you the statistics from summer. Here's the summer grade distribution. This is total on the exa uh, lab exam one and two. These are the quizzes, okay? So four sections, two taught by one TA, two taught by the other. These are not both taught by the same TA. These are not both taught by the same TA. One of these taught by the same TA, the other one taught by the same TA. One taught by the same TA, the other one taught by the same TA. And these TAs have taught for me for over 15 years. So they have a lot of experience. Even the beginning GSIs always say, whether it's lab or discussion, wow, my students between these two sections are so different. So there's absolutely no reason to give the same grade distribution within a given section. So I shouldn't say discussion section five should have the exact same uh, grade distribution as section seven, because it doesn't happen that way. Now here's the problem. See this GSI? Those students did worse on their lab exam one, two as an average. There are some students within there who did well, but their quizzes were really high. Since I make the grades based upon total points, I hope you can see that students in this section kind of have an unfair advantage, right? Because their overall score is higher because their quiz averages were higher relative to how they did it on lab exams. So what I do is I do this kind of plot, and then I adjust between sections. And I adjust it, keep it the same slope, but I move it up to the easiest of, in this case, 25 sections this semester, in this case, this one section. So I keep the same slope, but I move it up to the easiest. So when I do the total then, Students have adjusted quiz scores here, and of course, one of the sections will represent the easiest. I don't know where it falls in this graph, but one of them will represent the easiest. So that section will have zero points for adjusted quiz scores, but the other ones will have more to reflect that. Is that clear? And I do it because it's the fairest way to do it. Not many classes do this on campus. I wish they did. Now, if you're asking, is this really right, like I said, these were two sections top of the same GSI, same here. And the GSI said this section was so much better than this one, and vice versa. Okay? I can take and use the, lab, the discussion class where these students, now in summer it doesn't work, but in the regular semester, I can take these 28 students in the discussion class amongst 10 different discussion GSIs, and guess what? Those sections will be higher. And this section here, again, those students are scattered amongst 10 different discussion GSIs, and they fall upon a very similar position on the graph. Not identical, nor would it be expected to because it's statistics, but fairly similar. So that's one other basis to make this justification, okay? So are there any questions about that? I think it's the fairest way to do it. It takes a lot of work, but I think it's the right thing to do for you when there are multiple sections with variable scores. Now, some people have said, why don't you have the same quiz you give to all sections? Well, I guarantee you, if Tuesday morning took the same quiz as Friday afternoon, Friday afternoon scores would go up because students, of course, would talk about it. So that's why we can't do that, okay? Yes? Question? So, this graph will only give the, like, harder, lower, like, okay. things up, not things 
Correct. I do not take points away. I do not take points away. I keep the same slope, and I change the intercept. I change that intercept by keeping the same slope, and in that case, it would go up like this and over. So I do not take points away. It's adjusted to the easiest of the sections. Question. If all the two things are difficult, does that mean that the slope would be the same and no one would see help? So if all the GSIs were exactly the same and had exactly the same quizzes and stuff, I mean, then they should all fall on this data point here, or they'd all be a straight line like this, even though they're variable lab scores. But the, but the average would still be low, which means that the system doesn't help us. If all the GSIs are difficult. If all the GSIs are difficult, then the question is, so, so if there's no one like this, the system doesn't help you, is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Well, if there's no one off this curve, then I don't need to do the adjustment so much. But realize the class is curved, has always been curved, never not curved, no matter what rumors you hear. Back 50 years, I've looked through the records, it's always been curved. So if the overall total points are lower because I did not have to do an adjustment because all the GSIs were somehow miraculously on this line, which has never been the case, but if they were, then what that would mean is where my cutoffs are are lower, but they're still in the same Percentage point. I give about the same percentage A's, A minuses, B pluses. Any other questions about grades? Okay. Uh, let's move on to the Vibrio stuff. Question in the back. Yes. Yes. Is there a guarantee? Yes. So if you get 90% or above at the end of this semester, you are guaranteed some form of an A. A minus or A. That's true for both Bio 1A and the lab class. So we do want you to work together to learn the material. We do not want you to work together on the exams. But certainly work together, form study groups. I think study groups are a great way to learn. Also, you have five exams in the exam reader. Please take a look at those and start working on them in a few weeks, okay? You will see that by giving you five of them. You may think a question is completely different than one on the previous exam, but you'll see you needed the same concept. So what I've tried to do is write new questions that address the same concept, okay? So I definitely highly recommend you do the exam reader. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay. Let's now deal with the Vibrio stuff. So you're going to plate it out 200 microliters. You should see colonies like this, maybe 20 to 40. You should see, hopefully see about four or five that are bioluminescent. We'll turn off the light. If you hold the plate to the side, it's easier to see them. Now I'm going to show you a plate, a side view. I think most of you are familiar with this, but occasionally we have students um, who aren't that familiar with plates. So let me show you what a plate looks like from a side view. This is a Petri plate. Consists of the bottom, consists of the top, and the auger is here. That's the SWC auger. So what you want to do is use your micropipetter using sterile technique to take out the tip, and then tilt the lid, squirt the 200 microliters there, and then we have glass rods that you'll uh, sterilize to spread these out so that hopefully we get a nice uniform solution like this, the spread, and then we get those isolated colonies, okay? It goes on the auger. We occasionally have students put it on top of the plate here. It happens. When students have difficulty with the lab, I realize that these lab exercises may be new to you. So if when you go to lab, you're not 100% certain of what you have to do, that's okay, all right? But once you've done the lab, you should have a much better sense of what you did and why you did it, okay? So if you ever have questions, ask your GSIs. Ask during office hours. We try to uh, be here for you. Uh, I like teaching the lab class. The 1A faculty like teaching this. But that's the SWC auger. We should see some colonies like that. Now, what we want to do is ideally this colony started from one bacterium, became 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. And then those bacteria start to touch and we see a colony. But we can't be 100% certain that that was from one founding bacteria. So what we're going to do is take a sterile loop next time, lab three, take a sterile loop and we're going to streak it on a plate, get another sterile loop, cross this so we get some of those bacteria and streak it, take another sterile loop, cross it, streak it, another sterile loop, cross and streak it. So what we're trying to do here is to take these bacteria which ideally are all identical but we can't be sure and streak it so that when we get the next plate like this and we see isolated colonies, this indeed should have been from a single initial bacterium. But we're going to take and restreak it in the photosynthesis lab again 
using the same procedure so that when we get to the PCR lab, the fifth lab, we're really confident that that back colony is due to one founding bacterium because we want to do PCR on two specific genes. If that colony represents two different bacteria, we won't be able to get the sequence from them. Okay? I mean, there are some techniques, but we're not going to do them. It's a little bit too complicated for us. So this is the way it works, the PCR. This is that large double-stranded circular DNA. And we have two genetic loci. Loci can also be thought of as positions. Positions with information. One position encodes for the gene that corresponds to the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And we're going to have another gene that corresponds to the RPOB, RNA polymerase B. But let's just focus on one of them initially, OK? So what we'll know is this is the target. We want to get large quantities of that target so that once we have large quantities, we can send it out for sequencing so we can actually see what sequence that is. Because on that plate, we have no idea what bacterium it is. All right? So once we get the sequence, we can search a database to see what species it is, potentially. If it's new, then we have some more things to address. Then we want you to save it. We can characterize it. So what we have here is this is the target. We have primers. Primers are single-strand pieces of DNA. Single-strand pieces of DNA. And DNA has directionality, 5 prime to 3 prime. Okay. So I tend to use my arrows at the 3 prime end. So that makes this double-strand DNA 5 prime to 3 prime, 5 prime to 3 prime. To get a primer to anneal to this strand, I have to separate the double-strand target DNA. So now those two strands are completely separated from one another. What holds these two strands together? Hydrogen bonds. How can I break hydrogen bonds? Heat it. So what we'll do is we'll heat the sample. That will cause the template DNA strands to separate. We then add lots of primer. This primer here, I'm going to call this forward and this one reverse. I could call this one reverse and forward. Key thing, they come in pairs. Primers come in pairs, and they flank the target. So when I add this primer, it anneals to this strand, and it forms base pairing. Now there's a three prime end. So if I add DNA polymerase, it will add to the three prime end, and it will just start going along here. Add and add and add and add and add and add. That's called extension. So we've had a denaturation, where we separated the template double strand. We've had annealing, where we've added the primers. And now we have extension, where the DNA polymerase extends. Okay? And it will extend and extend and extend. And it just keeps going, because it has this large template here. But after a period of time, we stop this and start the next cycle. Okay? So let's see what happens when we start the next cycle. Okay? And this is difficult to grasp. If you draw this out, for three rounds of replication, in my experience, 95% of the students get it like that. But you have to draw it out for three rounds of replication. So let's just see this, OK? Now, this is from Campbell. It's unfortunate that it doesn't show this target as being much, much, much larger in the background. Because remember, that target's in this huge background of the chromosomal DNA. But what they've done here is just show a short stretch. So there's our target. We separate them, denature. We anneal our primers, and the primers extend. Okay, so light blue represents the primers. I would prefer to see these different colors so you know one is the forward, one's reverse, but that's okay. So they extend and they keep going. Now it will extend past the target because it still has template information to do that. And this one will extend past the target because it has template information to do that. But now watch what happens when we do the next cycle. So we're gonna do a second cycle, which will be the same steps. A denaturation, an annealing, and extension. So denature, we separate them. So these two double strands become four single strands. Okay? So what happens here is this is that strand on the left. There's the new primer. That's the extension. This is the strand on the right. There is the new primer extension. Now if you notice, this single strand of the double strand is now exact target length, right? It didn't go beyond at this end, but this one did. Let's go back to this. The left strand here extended past, but this one here when we separate it, oh, sorry, they did, uh, they did this one, primer, extend. And then they did this one, primer, extend. So now we have four double strands. We denatured, we annealed, we extended. So we have 
four double-strand molecules. We started with one, we got two, we got four. And these four are all longer than what we want. Okay? Now let's look at the third round. Notice this molecule here, of the double strand, gives us exact target next time. Primary nails extends. This molecule here gives us exact target, and the others don't. So what we do each round is we increase by two non-target. So we went from one to two, we increased to two, non-target, we increased to four, non-target. But now the third round we have two target and six non-target. When we do the next cycle, cycle four, we'll get 16 single-strand molecules, and we'll end up with this one will give us target, 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 target. Um, so we'll end up with now, we'll do the math on the board. This is a formula. And I'm going to go over this again. And if you draw this out, it will make more sense. And it's really one of these things, there aren't many things I really implore you to do, uh, but this is one of them because the sooner you do it, the faster you'll understand PCR. So we go from one double strand to two, to four, to eight, to 16, to 32, to 64, to 128, 256, 512, 1024. That's the same as 2 to the 10th is approximately 10 to the 3. So if we did 30 rounds, how many products would we have? 10 to the 9th, right? If we did 30 rounds, it would be 10 to the 9th, OK? So we have two non-target length. We have four non-target length. We have six non-target. So how many does that leave to be target? If there's eight, two target. Then we go to eight target. So how many, sorry, eight non-target. We'll keep doing that. Eight non-target. So how many are target? Eight, 16 minus eight, so eight target. When we get to 32, we have 10 non-target, 22 target, 64, we have 12 non-target. Because we're always increasing by 2, right? Always increase by 2. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So we have 20 non-target. How many does that make target? 1,004. So if you look at this graph, this is what happens. The non-target always increases by 2. And the target effectively becomes exponential. Okay? So when we do PCR, we'll have a huge product yield, and then we'll do uh, sequencing on it. Okay? So that's it for tonight. Uh, enjoy the lab, and I'll go over this next week as well. <laughs>